welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Justin Clark. I'm Adam Cronin. And today we're discussing the future of Mars. So we'll explore what NASA and SpaceX have planned for Mars in the short term, the challenges of living on a Martian um, colony in the medium term, and what Mars could one day become in the long term. Mm-hmm. So maybe to start, Madam Moore, why are we going to Mars in the first place? Why not go to Europa or Titan or somewhere else in our solar system? Definitely. So I'd, I'd like to answer that just with a quote from Elon Musk, because he really says it best. He says, Mars is the only realistic option in our solar system to become multiplanetary. Now, mm. multiplanetary, it's the only realistic planet, but like we talked about in the future of space travel, there are some pretty cool other destinations out there as far as moons. You know, Titan mm-hmm. and Europa are really good options. But it's worth noting that those are further away than Mars. So if you see a you know, map of the solar system, Mercury's closest, then Venus, then Earth, then Mars is the next closest one. And then if you wanted to go to Europa, that's farther, that's in Jupiter. And then if you wanted to go to Titan, that's in Saturn, that's even further. Yeah. So it's the, when you're dealing with distances this vast, it really makes a difference having a closer planet rather than a farther one. Mm-hmm. And it's also a place that is very similar to the moon. So it would take similar technology to land on Mars as it would to land on the moon. So as from a feasibility perspective, it's more similar than landing in a place like Titan which has, you know, dense atmosphere and all different Mm -hmm. kinds of uh, geological activity on the surface, or a place like Europa that's just total ice, like it's covered in ice, it'd be really hard to land on that. So if you're just landing Mm -hmm. on a rocky surface, we've already done it on the moon, we can do it again for Mars. Um, And then I'd, I'd say the other reasons that it's attractive is that it has ice, and mm-hmm. the atmosphere super thin, but there is some atmosphere. It's about 1% that of Earth. And mm-hmm. the atmosphere has CO2. So if you have CO2 and you have H2O, then you can create rocket fuel. Because rocket fuel is, is uh, you know, CH4 and mm-hmm. O2. And yeah. that's key. Because if we can't create rocket fuel on Mars, then there'd be no way to, to send rocket ships back to Earth at least with Mm -hmm. current technology. Yeah, and another thing to point out is the gravity difference. So Mars Mm -hmm. is roughly a third of the gravity of Earth, and Europa and Titan are roughly half, a little uh, less than half, the gravity of Mars. So it would be, it's actually, they have less gravity than our own moon, and we have a really difficult time with that um, low of gravity. And... You know, the change from Earth to Mars would be a little bit smaller than these other planets. And if you think about how important gravity is in the development of human like systems, like biological systems, then it's it's pretty clear that we need to at least approach our gravity and our environment as much as possible. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, we've never had people in partial gravity environments like Mars, but experts do seem to believe that the human body would be better at adapting to that than they would with, you know, zero gravity. Like, we already know zero gravity is pretty damaging to people Mm -hmm. in space. So Mm -hmm. it seems, you're right, it seems better that, you know, having 33 or 38% gravity on Mars is a much better situation. Yeah. Yeah, so what what do we think about the the plans for actually getting to Mars? Like what there's NASA, there's SpaceX, there's some other organizations, but it seems right. like NASA and SpaceX are kind of the two major players here. And obviously they're collaborating as well, but you know, what what are the plans? Definitely. To get there? Well, it's interesting when you see the plans just how different an organization like NASA operates to an organization like SpaceX. <laughs> so NASA has a much more cautious mission and part of that's because Mm -hmm. they want to get a quick win that they can then use that for leverage for congress to get more funding to do the mission they really want to do Mm -hmm. which is you know eventually to send people there 
So the initial mission is planned for 2020. So it's coming up soon from NASA. It's supposed to launch around June. And essentially they are sending a rover to Mars and this rover has a drill. So in the past they haven't had a drill. And mm -hmm. the importance of that is that the first meter of soil in the Martian surface mm -hmm. has been exposed to a lot of radiation from, yeah. you know, from solar flares solar wind, and from cosmic yeah. radiation. So it's unlikely that, there, that we would find signs of life in that first meter of soil. So to get a better likelihood of finding life, we need to drill deeper. Um, so this mm -hmm. rover is going to try to drill and collect some samples of rocks and soil and set them aside in a cache, basically to be analyzed and extracted from, from a later mission. And mm. when I heard about this, I was like, okay, you're going there to get samples and then you're just going to leave the samples there. Like, it seems <laughs> like you could just as easily get the samples if you came back later. Like, I don't mm. know how much time that really saves, but it just kind of shows how NASA operates where like they need the quick wins. Mm -hmm. But they're also yeah. doing some other cool stuff where they're testing a new method for producing oxygen from the Martian atmosphere. They're looking for other resources like subsurface water. They're, you know, they're getting another run at some new landing techniques. Um, so they're, they're trying some, they're going to find out some cool learnings, hopefully, that will help with future missions. Mm -hmm. But for, for NASA, it's unlikely they would actually send humans to Mars you know, by 2030, it's probably going to be beyond that, like more like mid 2030s or 2040. So that's mm -hmm. NASA. But with SpaceX, it's much more ambitious, which is the nature oh, yeah. of Elon Musk. So <laughs> he plans yeah. to send two cargo ships to Mars in 2022. Now, these cargo ships would basically set up the bare bones of what would be needed for humans once humans go there. Mm hmm. Then he plans in 2024 to send two crewed ships and two more cargo ships to Mars. Now, it's, it's worth noting that Mars and Earth only really rotate to be close to each other once every two years. So that's why you always see these two-year windows where, okay, we only launch every two years because it would take a really long time. Like It takes six months to get there if you're mm -hmm. lined up exactly to where Earth and Mars are closest, but it can take mm -hmm. a lot longer and becomes just impossible with current technology given how much extra fuel you need and resources. Mm -hmm. yeah. So basically, SpaceX's plan is in 2022, they send two cargo ships. In 2024, yeah. if the first thing is successful, they'll send two more cargo ships plus two crewed ships. And then every mm -hmm. two years after that, they would send more cargo ships, more crewed ships, and build up this city on Mars. Yeah. Yep. Which is incredible. You can look up like the visuals that SpaceX has put together for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really crazy to think of what could be done in this decade, right? Like we're we're just leaving twenty twenty or um, you just know the twenty tens right now. Yeah. yeah, we're leaving the twenty tens right now. And if you think about where we were in 2010 and where we could be 10 years from now, mm -hmm. it's pretty crazy. Like there might actually be a colony on Mars by 2030 and a pretty substantial one, like maybe in the dozens of people. Um, yeah, that's if everything and, goes right, though. I wouldn't necessarily yeah, say yeah, that's yeah. my most likely scenario, but yeah, if everything could, goes yeah. right then we could have a legit colony on Mars. It would mm -hmm. still be dependent on Earth, but we'd have a colony there by 2030 yeah. or 2027, maybe even. Yeah. Yeah. So why, like, what would that even look like? What would, let's say we do get to Mars at some point, doesn't have to right. be before 2030. What does it look like when we're there? Yeah. Well, whenever Elon gets asked about this, he always says that the hardest part is getting to Mars. Once we're uh -huh. there, it's relatively, it's obviously not easy, but well, yeah. the hardest part is getting to Mars and then landing on Mars. And part of the reason why, you know, it's so hard to get there is that it's not sustainable economically or it hasn't been until recently because 
you we didn't have reusable rockets before SpaceX. So it'd be like if you flew in a 747 and then at the end of your flight to New York, they just threw away the plane. Like that's how expensive <laughs> it was. So a rocket typically costs $60 million. And that's a one-time cost of $60 million per flight. But if you're able to use that rocket a thousand times, then a rocket flight only costs $60,000, which all of a sudden becomes very sustainable. So that's part of the innovation that has allowed us to get to Mars. Also, the mm -hmm. fact that the starship that Elon's building to send people to Mars is an incredible feat of engineering. I mean, this thing is yeah. like 35 stories high. It's massive. It can carry a crew of 100, maybe even 200 people. And that it has the thrusting capacity of it can carry about two X what the next biggest ship could like the Saturn V, And uh, so only now have we even scratched the surface of being able to get to Mars. But then once we get there, so it's, it's worth noting that 40 percent of attempted landings on Mars have failed and ended in crash. 20% of rocket launches crash or blow up before they even escape the Earth's atmosphere. So just by a pure numbers game, a lot of them fail because there's so mm -hmm. much at play. And mm -hmm. the reason why so many crash when they get to Mars is because Mars has an atmosphere that's 1% that of Earth. So yeah. it'd be like if you jumped off a high dive diving board, but there is no water in the pool. Like that's the difference between what it's yeah. like on Earth and what it's like on Mars. So if you have if you're going at 20 miles an hour on on Earth, it'd be like going 200 miles an hour on Mars. So the mm -hmm. the there's really only two ways that you can safely land on Mars. One is with a big parachute, but the yeah. problem is the bigger the parachute, the more likely it is to rip. Yeah, and, and then, you, it has to be a huge, huge. parachute. But because, you know, like you said, the pressure, the air pressure is not there. Well, the biggest parachute that they've ever used is 150 feet wide. That was the Curiosity rover that landed by NASA in 2012. And so you can't go much wider than that or else it's really likely to rip. So what you have to do is you have to have reverse thrusters that basically ease your landing by thrusting rocket fuel in the opposite direction. And even then, it's really hard. If there's a dust storm, you might not land perfectly straight. And if you land on a corner, then you're mm -hmm. likely to crash. And then the whole mission is wasted. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's all about the difficulty of getting to and then landing on Mars. Now, once you're on Mars, there's a few key, you know, it's not like you just get to hang out and drink, <laughs> uh, drink like LaCroix when you finally make it to Mars. You're going to basically be constructing a lot of, yeah. you know, most hours of the day, you'll be either constructing or you'll be uh, repairing or maintaining or, or you'll be researching. doing research. Yeah. yeah. So they, so the first things they'll have to build on Mars is a means to get fuel. Mm -hmm. um, because if you have four key elements, a rocket booster, a spaceship, a tanker, and a propellant plant, then you can go anywhere in space. So yeah. we're already sending the spaceship. They're going to have to build a rocket booster, which is you know the scaffolding that then launches a rocket up into space. Mm -hmm. A tanker, which is something that can transport the fuel from the propellant plant to the spaceship. And then you need the propellant plant, which we already talked about briefly. You're basically converting CO2 in the atmosphere and water in the ice into uh, methane and oxygen to create rocket fuel. Mm -hmm. um, the other th key things you'll need is energy is life on Mars. If you don't have energy, you're not going to have the ability to cleanse the air, cleanse the water, mm -hmm. you know, grow food. And so uh, setting up solar panels is going to be huge. And that's part of why Mars is attractive is because it's close enough to the sun where you can actually use solar power. Mm -hmm. But we may also need other forms of power for when there's a dust storm on Mars. Because uh, during a dust storm, you don't get nearly as much energy. So people have thought maybe we can do nuclear energy 
or something like that that could be yeah. deep underground. Yeah. Um, and then just the other things we would need is we need safe shelter from radiation. That's probably the single biggest threat once you get to Mars is radiation. Mm -hmm. And then eventually we'll need to grow our own food. But the plan, at least for SpaceX, is to basically have the astronauts rely on dried food from Earth for you know, the first however many years that just get sent in the cargo ships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of the things that I always think about in my idealized Martian colony is like these big glass domes that, you know, you can see the Earth and the sun um, from inside your dome. But in reality, that's not what it's going to be. They're probably going to be living underground with some sort of water, you know, H2O, H2O layer between mm -hmm. um, the roof and the surface because that could absorb a lot of the radiation. And yeah. it, it would be hard. I mean, it would be extremely difficult for the astronauts that are there. It's not going to be glamorous at all. It's going to be extremely difficult. And there aren't going to be that many resources. Like, there will have to be robots and some sort of mining process in Mar on Mars that will give the Martian colony all of the resources it needs. Like we're not going to be able to just keep sending supplies because the transit time is way too long. And, you know, it, they will have to somehow be self-sustaining. There will have to be some sort of redundancy of their systems built into the colony. Like they can't put all their eggs in one basket. I mean, in, mm -hmm. in reality, they are kind of putting all their eggs in one basket, which is like Mars, you know, working out. But once they get there, there there has to be some sort of distributed system for food generation. Like if all of your food is being produced in the same spot and then something happens to that little hub of food generation, everything is done pretty much. Yeah. So And it'll take a while for them to be self-sufficient. Elon Musk yeah. says he estimates it'll take 40 to 100 years. Yeah. So when you're dealing with those timescales, you're like, well, shit, we should go to Mars as soon as we can, because who knows how long conditions mm -hmm. on Earth will be stable and there won't be a world war or there won't be some mm -hmm. crisis or pandemic or, you know, 100 years is a long time to just have to keep sending resources from Earth like everything's fine. The governments are mm -hmm. still in place. It's a long time. Yeah, and one way, one thing we talked about in the future of space travel was the skyhook or mm -hmm. the, you know, the space tether that could essentially be the foundation of space infrastructure because we still don't have that. If we build a good infrastructure for getting into space, getting to Mars and sending resources, then this is a little bit more feasible because then we can cut transit times, we can in improve the success rate. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things we can do there. Yeah. And it's also worth noting that there are like, there are plans and there's a progression to get onto Mars. Like the first step is actually just getting people on some sort of space station that orbits Mars. And then that could be used as sort of a, an anchor point to get people from, you know, from the station to Mars, from Mars to the station, and then use the the orbit to kind of send people to and from earth from that um orbiter which is you know right. that's that's a more realistic and short-term thing that you know that's happening in in the the mars you know research and mission progression yeah but but part of what you lose there you know another good question is why do we even need to send humans to mars why not just send rovers to set up what we need to anyways yeah and, but and, we can't like we're, like rovers are not that good they're, they're good at like well we can send them exploring. but we just get well, limited results like that's we, what, yeah, we've that's sent what. rovers but the problem is they're only as smart as the programmers that program them or what they've programmed into them and mm -hmm. oftentimes they'll hit a snag that just totally stops pr productivity like i was mm -hmm. listening to this podcast of this one Mars NASA scientist who said that basically because there's such a long time delay they only can send instructions once per day to the rover 
Uh, so it's not like you have some guy with a joystick controlling the rover remotely in real time. That's not it at all. It's like you basically mm -hmm. program in what you want the rover to do that day. And if it hits mm -hmm. a snag, well, then the whole day is wasted. Like, for instance, in, in one example, they they directed this rover to dig for soil samples. But then it hit this like small rock, like not even a big rock. And it just didn't know what else to do. Like it could have easily just rotated like six inches to the left and then gotten a sample. But because you didn't have a human there seeing it, directing it in real time, they essentially wasted that whole day. And if you're yeah. trying to dig deep beneath the surface, like one meter beneath the radiation level of soil, then that's really hard to do with a remote uh, rover. Like these things aren't that smart. You'd be way better off either having a, an astronaut like there locally controlling the rover in real time mm -hmm. or just having an astronaut like actually out there digging along with the rover to to help mm -hmm. with manage the drill and everything. Yeah. Now, one way that I could see this improving and I, I also don't think that a rover will replace a human in even the medium term, probably just because there's so much that has to be done and so many degrees of freedom and interacting with your environment, especially in un a relatively unknown environment. Um, but with the rover and these instructions, I think with the advancement of AI and reinforcement learning over the past handful of years, there could be a better way. Now, I'm sure NASA researchers, SpaceX researchers have thought of this, but maybe instead of telling the rovers to do one specific thing like drill you could send an objective function which is sort of what's used in reinforcement learning the same way that AlphaGo sort of learned it's you know had an objective function which was to win at go and that's really simplifying things but you could send sort of the foundational learning process and the foundational um um, AI algorithms to this rover and then it'll learn to do these things over the course of maybe a couple days and it'll optimize for that and then maybe it can store that process in memory somewhere like on, on storage and if you if it ever needs to revisit that task it can go you know access those you know what it had previously learned and that's a very yeah that's going to be a really important use for artificial intelligence. And it's not an AGI by any means, but it is something that could be really helpful and help us not have like humans, like you said, give these really exact instructions. Mm -hmm. And if they're not perfect, then the Rover will just, you know, get stuck. Yeah, We need more flexible autonomous robots that can, change their behavior based on conditions and like you said mm -hmm. just drive towards an objective function with mm -hmm. more freedom as far as the how you achieve that objective function mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but so yeah it is possible that with advances in robotics we could solve many of the research questions that have been posed with with mars for instance was there life on Mars at any point? Is there an archaeological record of life on Mars? Is there life there on Mars right now? What would it take mm -hmm. for life to develop on Mars in the future? We already know, this seems like there's evidence that there used to be water on Mars, liquid water, mm -hmm. and it was warmer and wetter. It was hot enough that it probably had an atmosphere. So one question scientists want to know is, was it warm and wet for a very long period of time, like Earth is now? Or was mm -hmm. it just sort of a short period of time where something happened, like it got hit by a massive asteroid and then was warm and wet for a short period of time, but it's not really suitable for life? So there's a mm -hmm. lot of questions that, that scientists want to answer from a research perspective. But yeah. the other key mission that would not be solved, no matter how advanced the robots are, is the idea of setting up another instantiation of humanity on a planet like Mars so mm -hmm. that if something horrible happens on Earth, then we, the human race can still live on. And, mm -hmm. you know, Elon has this quote where he says, we have a window right now to become multiplanetary, but we don't know how long that window will last. 
Either we become a multiplanetary species and a spacefaring civilization, or we'll, we'll remain stuck on one planet until an inevitable extinction event, extinction event wipes us out. So that's like the real, real reason we're going to Mars. Mm -hmm. It's, wor it's uh, interesting to think about how will humans change or adapt if we do land on Mars? How will they adapt to the gravity? How will they adapt to the radiation? How will they adapt to the lighting? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's interesting to think about radiation maybe first because we talked about you have radiation from the sun and then you also have cosmic radiation, which is just coming from all directions in space. And yeah. the crazy thing about space is that you have these highly charged particles like protons and electrons that are flying at incredible speeds with incredible power through space. And we don't really get them on Earth because our magnetosphere and our atmosphere protect mm -hmm. it. But if you're in yep. space, even if you have the best spacesuit that technology can design mm. that is able to block UV radiation, you're not going to be able to block gamma radiation. And you can have yeah. these particles that literally just go straight through your spacesuit and out the other end. And they can create mutations in your DNA. They can create cognitive issues. They can mm. seriously harm almost every function of your body. So I wonder how humans will cope with that. And, you know, aside from just living underground inside these massive Martian mountains, which, by the way, Mars has the biggest volcano in the solar system. So mountains oh. on Mars, they're not like tiny hills. They're like, it's like Mount Everest. <laughs> All over the place. <laughs> All over the place, yeah. Jeez, that's that's really crazy. And I think, I don't, have I... Um... I don't know if we've talked about this on the podcast before, but there was one episode on One Strange Rock where one of the astronauts was talking about how when he first got to space, he would close his eyes and just like see these like flashes of light every like it just Whoa. like with his eyes completely closed. And the reason for that was is because these uh, particles are going through his body, through the suit, through everything and hitting his optic nerve. Whoa. And it's like creating these visual effects that was ter they were absolutely terrifying to him and yeah. I I under I mean I could see why that would be terrifying. So yeah, there's there's so much that needs to be done in order right. to like get us safely on Mars and adapting to Mars. Like I I honestly don't think that humans of today like the way that we think of ourselves as a species that is not going to be the most successful, you know, version of humanity. Um on Mars, like we're going to have to do some mm -hmm. sort of genetic modifications or or really figure out how to or like, we'll just evolve naturally, like with the yeah, first but people that built takes on so Mars long. And, yeah. like that, like the evolutionary. Although I don't know, though, because so much longer. That's that's true. But I wonder how much we would adapt if a baby was conceived and born and raised in the Martian environment. Just because humans are so adaptable, I wonder how much your bodily functions would adapt just so, by always living in that environment. Yeah, I I see what you're saying, and I think it could work. I think a natural evolutionary process could work if we had thousands of people on Mars, because right. only only a well, small. Well, he wants fraction... to put a million of people on Mars, Elon, well, eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that once that happens, then there will be. A natural evolution that takes place that's that's the only way that it'll happen right. um, but in the short term there will only be a handful of people and people probably won't be reproducing and there's a lot of um, issues with all of this radiation it might just make people totally infertile because right. all of our biological processes have evolved for the earth's environment mm -hmm. the earth's gravity the earth's level of radiation the you know, the, the oxygen, the like the whole atmosphere, we've evolved for that. And if we just like shock our bodies completely by going to another planet, I'm not sure that that's going to happen. And yeah. you also have to take into account the fact that the length of training for people going to Mars, it, it especially for women, it's going to put them way beyond the healthy 
childbearing ages, right? Like it's, it's beyond a PhD level education probably for the people that are going to be going to Mars. Well, they could, I mean, they could do extra training for people who are already astronauts. Yeah. And, but to be an, a successful astronaut, that's already in your thirties probably. And to then to get to Mars yeah. and then to like, there's just a lot I mean, of you could probably do in vitro things. or something. Yeah, I'm but, sure there are ways. But yeah, you're right. It's it's a challenge. Yeah, I wonder how people are going to adapt. There's mm-hmm. also been some interesting suggestions for how our physiology might change on Mars. Like mm-hmm. when, you know, Scott Kelly, this astronaut, spent a whole year in space and then they analyzed how it affected him. And he was like four inches taller than he was before he left because the zero gravity mm-hmm. made his spine like extend but he had a lot of other really bad issues. Like his eyesight was mm-hmm. seriously uh, was seriously damaged because, you know, you don't have the same pressure of your eyes. So your eye is like a different shape so, and it affects your, your vision. Mm-hmm. And he also, his bones were more brittle. He was a lot weaker. So you can imagine these Martians as being like tall, like slender, not very strong, sort of brittle bones. But some people also say they may end up having like red eyes because that helps prevent against like radiation and UV light. Mm. And it's interesting. They say that if you eat like a ton of carrots, you can turn orange like on Earth. That's a known thing. But that orangeness actually helps protect you from some of the conditions on Mars. So people may like eat just have a certain diet that prevents radiation damage that turns them sort of like an orangish hue and you know there's also pharmaceuticals that you can take but the the reality is there's nothing you can do to prevent you know at least like half of the radiation that's coming at you because there's just no natural protection from from the magnetosphere Mm -hmm. or the atmosphere so i mean if we talk about a little bit what mars could become in the long term one suggestion is we put some sort of shield between the sun and Mars to at least block the solar radiation. Like we could mm. put some sort of big magnetic contraption or some tech yeah. that hasn't yet been developed mm-hmm. that could then sort of shield at least the solar radiation. You'd still get the cosmic radiation coming from every direction of the yeah. cosmos, but at mm-hmm. least that would help somewhat. Yeah, and to be fair, there are still... Radio, radioactive particles that are just shooting through earth and shooting through us every second right like yeah. it's not it's not like this is uncommon and we can't adapt to it the problem is just getting us to the point from where we are now to being able to survive on mars and you know yeah. and be relatively healthy now so let's assume that we can actually get to mars we can be healthy you know there's either we have safe structures for current human you know systems human biological systems or we somehow have genetic modifications or evolve or whatever to get to the point where we can live on mars whether that's in a city or you know whatever what does it look like what so politically it's going to be completely new people going to mars and it's going to be astronauts living on mars what what do the colonies look like politically speaking like wh- yeah. how do they interact how how do they interact with earth like there's a lot of questions just right. from a social standpoint of how the people on mars are going to act and will act going forward yeah initially it's likely to be a direct democracy where to make any major decision, you sort of need everyone on board because it's such a tightly knit group and everyone depends Mm -hmm. on one another. You'll likely have the captain of the ship or, you know, Mm -hmm. a couple captains, one for each ship that lands on Mars that will sort of be the tiebreakers if there's any decisions that are split between the other astronauts. Mm -hmm. But over time, you would likely need more complex systems. You know, once you have... 15 spaceships worth of people on there then you would need some sort of representative democracy or or it it could still be direct but you need like a system to determine what happens and Mm -hmm. elon has actually made some interesting comments on this 
where he says that he would like for Mars to have a more simple legal system than on Earth. And he sees it as a major failing of the legal system on Earth that it gets, just keeps getting more and more complex. And because mm -hmm. of that, there's more and more loopholes. Like, mm -hmm. the Constitution is really short. It's like a few pages long. And it's done a mm -hmm. great job outlining how America should run. But if you look at our legal co code, it's like no one would be able to read through that and actually comprehend it. So Elon yep. has proposed there should be a system where it requires almost unanimous consent to add a new law or maybe like, you know, three fourths majority to create mm -hmm. a new law, but you only need a simple majority to remove a law. So yeah. you would be focused really on like just the key stuff. Like there'd be like a 10 commandments on Mars and they'd be written with as few, as few words as possible. But mm -hmm. other than that, like, you, you know, people pretty much just operate on, those key principles there's not like every possible scenario written out in legal codes with exceptions and precedent and so i i like that way that he's thinking about it but as far as what it would like to actually be in that colony you know i just yesterday watched ad astra mm -hmm. with brad pitt I, I, have you seen that no i haven't i really loved it a lot of people thought it was maybe slow or something but i thought it was amazing because it really communicates what it would be like psychologically to be out there in space like so much of the battle is you in your own psychology staying sane doing what needs to be done not freaking out when there's a moment of crisis and that's going to be the hardest part like it's just staying sane and, and staying true to the essentials of what you know needs to happen is going to be really tough. There's going to be a lot of loneliness, a lot of depression, probably seasonal mm -hmm. disorder is going to be like way more extreme than when you're just in Michigan or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and part of what's going to be a concern is, you know, if someone freaks out and they want to kill themselves or they create a mutiny or they like things could go bad very quickly, especially if you only have a small number of people. So mm -hmm. in the, this movie Ad Astra, they have these constant psychological evaluations to make sure that you're fit for the, for the mission. And they'll yeah. analyze your voice, they'll analyze the content of what you're saying, they'll analyze your heart rate and your other biometrics to make sure you're still fit to carry out this mission. Um, and if you're not fit, they put you in this like rehabilitation room, which is like a room that's like, you know, it's just there's no windows or anything, but it's covered with like screens of just like oceans and flocks of seagulls and yeah, but it's, I, I love the way they portrayed what it would actually be like to be living in this far flung place in the solar system away from earth and, you know, still try to maintain your sanity mm -hmm. and you'd be with like the same small group of people every time. So you'd probably get sick of each other. It, it's, it's going to be uh it's going to be tough for those first settlers. And so one newscaster asked Elon Musk, they said, so who would be the right people to send to the Mars colony? And he's like, people who are ready to die, people who are ready to risk it all. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, because you're you're not going to have a great life if you're exposed to that much radiation and loneliness and hardship and uncertainty. It's going to be real tough for those first colonists. Can you imagine the amount of like like the psychological and physical prowess of the Marsh the Martian colony? So it's basically going to be the Olympics mentally and physically. Like you you're not an astronaut if you're not insanely smart and you're not insanely fit. And the whole Martian colony is going to be like the best of the best of the human race essentially. Yeah. And if, you know, let's say that all these different countries, you know, start to send people to the Martian colony and they're all insanely smart, they're all, you know, they're all physically fit, it's going to be pretty crazy to see how that evolves. It's almost like there will be some sort of selection. And if you fast forward, you know, several hundred years and there, you know, and there's a way to keep people safe and reproducing and all that stuff. So 
some sort of evolution can take place. It's yeah. going to be pretty ridiculous. Like if we have a diverse group of people that are there, but sort of all of them meet these like intellectual and um, physical requirements, it, it will be like a super species yeah. essentially that gets produced from Mars. Yeah, and, I mean, look at like people who came to America were the risk mm-hmm. most risk, uh, highly risk tolerant, adventurous mm-hmm. people who you know, had to have been physically fit enough to make it across the sea, make it through the hardships of not enough food and, you know, Native Americans shooting arrows at you. So that's part of why America is the most powerful country in the world mm-hmm. right now. You could imagine that on an even greater scale, like you said, with sending our best and brightest and most physically and mentally fit people to Mars. And then also, by necessity, the types of technology they would have to build there would be, if there's a good relationship between Earth and Mars, incredible new discoveries that would then help people on Earth. But if there's an antagonistic relationship, then Mars could have like way more technology and maybe even more leverage and, and military power uh, than yeah. Earth. Even with a smaller amount of people, like a much right. smaller amount of people. Like if they create like an antimatter drive or some, like something we haven't <laughs> even like started building... It could mm-hmm. be a total game changer. And the expanse that show on Amazon that Jeff Bezos' favorite show, they actually have that scenario where there's Earth and Mars and everyone talks about how good Martian technology is. It and it makes sense. It makes mm-hmm. sense that that's how it could go. And I I wonder what would happen when so let's say we have a Martian colony, we have people from China, from the US, from Russia, from Europe, from Africa, from Australia, like a whole, just basically a melting pot of the best of the best and on Mars. What happens when these people that are insanely intelligent are just getting these, you know, these jobs and these missions from Earth that don't really line up with the philosophy of the reality on Mars? Like they're getting, it's almost like um, how you hear in the military, the the frontline people don't really like getting people. Yeah, have the boots a totally on the ground. different viewpoint than the and commanders. they don't necessarily like it. Like the commanders that are just sitting, you know, in their nice cushy office back home, giving them orders, don't really know the reality of what it's like. And when they're when they're getting these orders, there might actually start to be a sort of antagonistic relationship. And since they're smart and since these people are all working together, it almost might be a unified thing. Like I, I honestly don't think after like over time there will be, you know, the, a Chinese colony, a U.S. colony, right. an African – like it will just be one colony and they will be together. Like they will – they're going to be going through such hardship that everything will probably start to be shared a little bit and it'll just be this big community. And instead of, they're just going to be like, well, why, like, why should we be enemies? Like, why should like the U S people on Mars and the Chinese people on Mars be enemies? How about like, why don't like, we should maybe start to question the earthlings. Like, why are they acting this way? Why are they giving us these orders? And there, there really could be a sort of antagonistic relationship developed. Yeah. And if they start to plan for this over the long term, and you know they kind of play the game for a little bit, but they develop technology, start to um, become self-sufficient. Over the next couple hundred years of a Martian colony, there could be some serious conflict between Earth and Mars. Yeah. I mean, there's they certainly wouldn't start a conflict while they're still dependent on earth yeah and yeah. you know elon who's super optimistic even he thinks it'll take 40 to 100 years to mm-hmm. be fully self-sufficient so i don't think it's not a concern in like the short or medium term but yeah definitely in the long run if this pans out the relationship between mars and earth is going to be crucial for how humanity proceeds mm-hmm. into the far mm-hmm. future yeah so Maybe that's a good place for us to then explore the future scenarios. Yeah, let's do it. All right, Justin, what is the 
worst case scenario for the future of Mars. Worst case scenario. So really the worst case in my mind is that it just doesn't happen. Like there's an extinction event on Earth that just prevents us completely from developing any sort of colony on Mars. And that's, you know, that's a very quick worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. um, but there are, there are also worst case scenarios. What we were just talking about where there is an antagonistic relationship between Mars and Earth in the long term could be an extremely dangerous scenario. And we don't, like, I don't want Earth and Mars to be just the start of another interstellar warfaring species. Like, we, we should not be continuing on the path that we have been, right? Where we just, like, it's us versus them, and we have these, all right, of these it should tendencies be all towards war. Of humanity and life working together. Yeah. Exactly, but I think in the worst case, that's not the, that's not what happens, and there is conflict. And if you think about the scale of conflict that this could be a Mars versus Earth war, that would be ridiculous. Like that would be that would almost be like planet ending yeah. warfare. And I don't know how likely it is that I mean, yeah, we're in the worst case. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I don't know how likely it is that. Mars would want to go to war with Earth. Mm -hmm. Like, it seems more likely that Mars would be like, hey, we are independent now. We don't take orders from Earth. Mm -hmm. And what are you going to do about it? Yeah. You know, and so I think it's more likely to be that sort of a thing than like a true war between the two. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, no, it, it could not be rosy for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And those are those are two pretty bad cases in my mind obviously there are other worst cases like we get to mars and then there are all these issues people can't develop people can't reproduce like it's like the colony just doesn't take hold even if yeah. we get there in the first place and it just you know it's unbelievably miserable for the people that are there right yeah so that's that's another worst case um yeah so i'm curious totally. what yours are yeah i i put my worst case scenarios sort of as tears along the different timeline so I agree the worst thing would be imagine there are some major setbacks maybe even some tragic incidents that happen like let's say Mar uh, SpaceX's first crewed mission to Mars ends in tragedy and all the people like 100 people or 200 people die mm -hmm. that would be a major blow and that could be enough to sway public opinion and government opinion and investor dollars to say like, hey, maybe we should just focus more on Earth. Maybe we're not ready for Mars. And mm -hmm. then it could not happen. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's like the first worst case. Let's say we get past that and we actually do get to Mars and we do, you know, set up a, a colony there. It could be the case that over the next, you know, 40 to 100 years, something happens on Earth. Like there's World War Three breaks out between uh, America and China or there's you know major climate catastrophe or you know something happens there's some sort of chaos that stops supplies going from Earth to Mars mm -hmm. um, and that would that would also result in the death of the Martian colony mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another one is let's say there's still is supplies but like you said if there are serious health effects where people aren't, you can't have babies on Mars, or mm. everyone ends up dying in their 30s if you're born on Mars because there's just too much radiation. That, that would be another scenario where it just, we wouldn't be able to succeed at least until we'd been there for like hundreds of thousands of millions of years with, through evolution. Mm -hmm. Another horrible scenario that Quillette actually just posted about is it's possible that Mars dust or microbes could come back to Earth and infect Earth and create like a pandemic on Earth. Oh, now, man. This is still very, um, it's very, like, we don't know for sure that this is even a possibility because we haven't yet found any actual life on Mars. And, and the soil is only mildly toxic. Uh, like, it's not, you could actually breathe it in and it'd be fine. You just don't want to, like, eat 
tons of dirt basically like but there is a small level of toxicity but mm -hmm. if there were some sort of microbes that came back and infected earth that just seems like something that could be oh. if we're going worst case scenario like yeah it could be like so, war of the worlds but but instead of the the bacteria uh in pathogens defending yeah. earth against aliens it'd be like the pathogens of mars infecting earth Wow, that's actually really scary. I hadn't thought about that before, but if you think of a bacteria that can survive in such an extreme environment that is Mars, and you bring it to this like oasis of Earth, yeah, that that, that whatever that microbe is would just like blow up because it. I mean, it would be right. like the invasive species to the max. And they had a movie on that called Life with Ryan Reynolds and it's a oh, really good horror that. movie. It's real good for any Dude. space geeks out there, but that's terrifying. And then I guess the final worst case scenario would be like yours. Mars does get established as a colony. It does become self-sufficient, but it ends up being antagonistic between earth. And you could almost imagine it's like earthlings stay in our sort of current form here on earth. And then mm -hmm. we kind of evolve into almost a different species on Mars. And there's not a lot of interactions between the two. And mm -hmm. it would almost be like a different species that eventually maybe couldn't even reproduce with a human earthling. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know how bad that would be. Like maybe it's fine as long as one of us survives and succeeds. But obviously it would be better if we were sort of a united front. Mm -hmm. taking on the cosmos together earth and mars yeah totally so agree that's my worst case yeah because at some point there will be speciation meaning that the earth like earthling humans and martian humans will become separate species and over enough time they're not going to be able to reproduce together or you know that could take a long time but it's it's something to where if you project way far out and then we're dealing with a totally different intelligent species, essentially. Mm -hmm. The same way that, you know, there are different versions of monkeys. There are different versions of birds like that can't reproduce together and probably don't collaborate anymore. And that could be a way easier um, progression into an us versus them mindset. And that, I mean, it would be very easy to take the us versus them to the extreme if we are different species. Mm -hmm. And I do think if it happens, like if we're, if there is a Martian colony for long enough, there will be a totally different species, yeah. um, which, you know, that's a little scary, but it also could be really awesome. Mm -hmm. Maybe we talk about that <laughs> with the awesome scenarios, the best case scenario. What do you think for the best case? Best case scenario. My best case, I like to think about it sort of like a video game where you get certain achievements unlocked. Like we landed <laughs> on the moon, achievement unlocked. Like setting up a colony on Mars, that's a major achievement that you can unlock. Mm -hmm. So I guess my best case is the maximum number of achievements are unlocked. Like we <laughs> become multiplanetary, we're self-sufficient, our risk of extinction goes way down because we're on two different places. And then mm -hmm. because we're in zero gravity or, you know, minimal gravity environment and we're in space and we have to deal with this environment, we have we're able to develop far greater technology simply out of necessity. And mm -hmm. that technology could seriously help people on Earth. There's already some companies that engineer certain resources in space to take advantage of the zero gravity environment, because mm -hmm. when you're doing something like let's say you're trying to 3d print a heart mm -hmm. it's really hard to have the right scaffolding structure of the heart when you're building it yeah. because gravity just squishes it all down but if you're yeah. in zero gravity you can construct these elaborate elegant whether they're biological mm -hmm. constructs or it's a new type of microfiber that could be mm -hmm. used as a space tether or you know types of materials that we haven't even imagined yet can be possible if you build them on Mars. You know, we, we may also get, we may also discover 
fully reusable clean energy by having to develop a nuclear plant on Mars. Um, mm. There's a tremendous amount we can learn. So, and I would say if we figure out how to deal with radiation and we're able to adapt and cope with that, that would be a serious uh, win in us being able to colonize the cosmos. So my best mm -hmm. case scenario is we unlock the maximum number of achievements and we have a really exciting future to look forward to as, as earthlings and we can uh, dedicate mm -hmm. ourselves to that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm totally with you on that. I think I would echo pretty much everything you said. And I do want to highlight one of the achievements, mm -hmm. which is, I think in the best case, we figure out a way to terraform Mars. Yes. Like we don't have to be living under these, you know, these shelters and, you know, these really un uninviting, you know, habitats really like we don't need to be ca a, a cave dwelling dwelling species we can actually live and naturally breathe that yeah. that atmosphere and there might even be a way to get to the point where the um you know the only difference is really the um the gravity mm -hmm. and you don't have there isn't all the radiation like we can maybe genetically modify um Mars or, or genetically modified plants to grow on Mars and you know absorb the extra radiation and be more resilient to the solar radiation and maybe that would be nice if plants were like super photosynthetic like they could mm -hmm. they could handle a ridiculous amount of solar radiation right. and and we they need could, some bacteria too to like create yeah they help create the atmosphere yeah that, that was like cyanobacteria is one of the, I think it was the earliest bacteria that converted um, CO2 to oxygen. Um, yeah. and, and that could be if we somehow modified that and that sort of kickstarted the process, then maybe over the course of several hundred or even several thousand years, we could have a, a similar environment on Mars as there is on right. Earth. Yeah, I, I heard one estimate that said it'll take 100,000 years <laughs> before we'll be able to actually breathe on Mars. Yeah. But that's with current knowledge of technology. There's always the yeah. chance that there's some game changer. Yeah, we just need to make Gaia's little brother. Or Gaia's well, little let, let's sister. talk about what, what, what it would take to terraform just briefly. So okay. one snapshot that I've heard is that, or one thing I've heard is that Mars is like a snapshot of what Earth was like when life mm -hmm. first developed which is kind of promising because it's like, okay, this is like a old ancient earth, right? When life would have been starting to get, to mm -hmm. get going, that seems like we can maybe kickstart the process and accelerate it. And what we would need to do is just like how Mars used to be warmer and wetter, we make it warmer and wetter once again by, mm -hmm. you know, we can heat up the poles to re release some of the ice into liquid form which will make mm -hmm. it warmer and wetter. We can, you know, put bacteria that can turn the some of the, uh, you know, chemicals into something like an atmosphere that can then mm -hmm. protect against radiation. Mm -hmm. We already talked about the possibility to create like a sort of artificial magnetosphere by putting some sort of structure in between the sun and Mars. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We could put up factories that basically pump out the greenhouse effect as much as we possibly can um, yeah. to basically accelerate what global warming you know is on earth that we're trying to stop on earth we would actually want to accelerate that on mars mm -hmm. um, and there's probably many other ways we could terraform mars that haven't been thought of but it will take you know mm -hmm. at least a thousand a couple thousand years it seems like um, yeah there ha there have been some some ways that people thought of that we can create a real magnetosphere, which is, you know, the, the really fast um, spinning uh, molten core in the middle of earth. Like we could somehow How we do, do that? that. So essentially, so here's one idea, you know, there's probably a few different ways we could do this, but we need to liquefy the core of Mars, which would be done by like, oh, no problem. Yeah. Just like a giant ass <laughs> nuke. 
in the middle of Mars that would liquefy and sort of get everything turning and like generating this magnetic field. Um, and that yeah. might, it probably wouldn't be as much a big enough, um, magnetosphere to like be on par with earth, but it could be something like a, an extra layer of, you know, We'd probably honestly need like nuclear fusion technology or something like that. Yeah, like it's pretty ridiculous what is actually needed. Yeah, because um, I've heard Elon made the point of, oh, why don't we just nuke the poles? But I watched this this like show, this YouTuber talk about how it wouldn't be nearly enough to unlock the water, and mm -hmm. you also couldn't really do that if you had colonists on Mars because yep. it would disrupt life there. So we either need to like just start nuking the hell out of it before <laughs> anyone gets there, or once people get there, it doesn't really make sense to nuke it. But, but there could certainly be some technology, like if we figure out nuclear fusion as opposed to fission, that could be a way, um, and there could be other ways we haven't thought of. Yeah, it just seems like the best way to do it would be to somehow speed up the evolutionary process, get biological things there and adapting to that environment. And right. if we could speed up the process of humans, I mean, that would be a really, like, how do you decide? There's a lot of philosophical issues with this, too. That right. we haven't what happens really with these them. new biological organisms that started as Earthlings, but then adapted to yeah. Mars, and then maybe they're threatening to earthlings and maybe some of them come back on the ship to earth yeah. and it, yeah. there's a lot of scary scenarios you could mm -hmm. think of yeah well anyways i think i think that you had a lot of really good best case scenarios i think that the achievement you know the progressions of achievements is a really good way to look at the one last thing that i will say is i'm i'm a huge fan of the skyhook and the space tether and i think yeah. that sort of that sort of um, infrastructure is one component of the best case. So it would make it so it would make it very unlikely that there are um, some events on Earth that would lead to like supply chain cutoffs. Um, so like it would be much easier and much cheaper to send stuff to Mars, which is almost a prerequisite. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's there's a lot of good things that could happen with that. And then we can start unlocking the later achievements, like exploring Europa and Titan. Even if we don't colonize those places, we can at least study them and we can study the outer yeah. reaches of our solar system a little more easily. Well, if we successfully colonize Mars, I feel confident that we will eventually successfully colonize someplace yeah. like Titan, which is probably even more attractive and yeah. a similar distance. Well, I, I have, guess it's further, but Europa yeah. would be a similar distance as Earth to Mars, Mars to Europa. Yeah, I have seen some interesting concepts of space, of colonies that could work on Mars that are actually, um, they're more achievable than terraforming because it's a pretty insane feat. Um, but there could be some colonies that sort of live on this rotating machine that the the force pushing outward we could make that equal the gravity of earth essentially hmm. um so it's like this big rotating disc I feel like a lot of martian dust would get in there and it may, well it would yeah. like the disc would have to be covered like and there might be a uh, a center with a whole bunch of trees and like a sort of earthly an earth-like environment um, right like the uh like the stanford taurus but rather than yeah. in space like actually on mars yeah and yeah. it would be it would be spinning and you know gravity for the people on the edge of this disc would be roughly 1g and uh, you know minus 9.8 meters per yeah. second squared i but, doubt that would be like a medium or near-term thing just because no, there again, are way bigger problems than gravity <laughs> on mars yeah yeah because if really if need be people can come back after a couple of years yeah i mean that would be probably insanely inefficient like knowledge wise like it would be way better if people could stay there and pass down and like have the experience of everything on mars and be able to learn from that and adapt to that in the future because if you're sending well, the, new the current missions to mars is six months to get there you spend six months on mars and six mm -hmm. months back 
-hmm. but that's obviously when you're just doing a mission and you're not a colonist. Like if you're a colonist, it's a one way ticket. Yeah, pretty much. So yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot that could go right and a lot that could go wrong. With well, let's Mars. let's bring it to the <laughs> most likely. So, what's mm-hmm. your most likely scenario? Most likely scenario. So, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic. I I really don't think that we will get. Um, anything close to Elon Musk's, you know, optimism here and like his timelines. And I think that's just, I think it's good. We need an Elon Musk, but I also think that it's a little optimistic to think that we could have people living on Mars within the decade. And I also think that given the, the probability of failure in a lot of these cases, like Elon Musk sending a couple of rockets to test Mars, that's a sample size of two. That does not equal, you know, you can't really say that everything is going to be okay if we successfully land two giant rockets on Mars. Right. And yeah, there, NASA would need way more proof to then send humans, but SpaceX yeah. operates differently. Yeah, and I, I seriously think that, and I don't want this to be true, but I, I think something by necessity has to go very wrong like i don't think we know enough and i don't think we're technically capable enough to make sure to uh, or to be certain that everything related to mars all the missions to mars involving humans will be successful and there will probably be another um apollo like issue but maybe with more people and i think I'm I'm a little scared. I'm scared that we might be moving a little bit too fast, but at the same time, we need to be moving, right? Like yeah. We, we don't so know it, how long the window is open. Yeah, I I don't know how I feel about it, but I'm I'm a little bit scared that something will go wrong because we just don't have enough information and we we're not technically capable enough to reduce the probability to near zero. Like I think, I think the probability of failure is far too high mm-hmm. for us to, you know, think that everything will go smoothly with humans. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good, most likely. My most likely is that I think we will land humans on Mars sometime in the early 2030s or mid 2030s. Mm-hmm. So. I'm not as optimistic as Elon Musk, but I'm not as cautious as Kip or NASA. Uh-huh. So I think yeah. it'll likely be somewhere in that time frame. I agree with you that I think there will be one or more major setbacks on Mars. I just hope that the setback is not like a crew of 100 people dying and it's more like, okay, we successfully got them to Mars but there was some problems setting up the propellant plant and luckily there's enough food for them to survive, but they weren't able to set up the structures that they need to. So we're setting an additional two cargo ships. Yeah. Like, yeah. like I could see that sort of situation happening where there are setbacks, but it's not like there's some major tragedy that makes us rethink the whole operation. Mm-hmm. And I, I am optimistic that eventually we will set up a colony on Mars we're going to have an outpost on the moon. And yep. I, I think that's what is going to happen. And it, it's exciting. And anyone who's listening, yeah. who's into space, there are so many ways you can get involved. There are so many businesses that are catering to the needs of space, like 3D printing yeah. companies, printing colonies, uh, all sorts of materials, science, so mm-hmm. it's a really exciting uh, place to be, mm-hmm. and and it's a, and it's exciting time to live in the space time continuum. Like we are <laughs> about to achieve an incredible feat. This is like yeah. as big or bigger than landing on the moon. Like landing on the first other planet and actually setting up an outpost there. That is yep. huge. So I feel super lucky just to be able to live through this current time that we're living in. Yeah, I, I'm completely with you. I do think that 
with all of this research that's going on, no matter how many failures or like setbacks there are, like we will continue progressing. I think it's inevitable. The only thing that will stop our progression is some sort of extinction event on earth. But even then, I don't, I don't think there will be a, a reasonable extinction event that'll wipe out all of humanity. Now there will probably be some, or there could be something that wipes out a large chunk, but I think humanity and intelligent life will bounce back eventually on right. earth. Maybe it'll wipe out humanity, but it won't wipe out all the microbes and then the microbes will re-evolve. Yeah, it, and, d it depends on yeah. the nature of the extinction event, right? right? Like a climate change catastrophe probably wouldn't wipe out all of humanity, but it would probably wipe out a huge chunk of humanity. Um, that's but why we that's need to case. go to Mars before that window closes and there's yeah. the next world war or the next asteroid or the next major volcano. Yeah, and hopefully we, can figure, hopefully we can figure our own shit out on Earth and on Mars. Like, we should, we should have all of this stuff figured out. And if we make all of these scientific advancements, what happens to religion? What happens to, like, all of this unscientific thinking we see today? Like, what I think there's so many things that will be better if there is a Martian colony, like even if there is some sort of antagonistic or like us versus them mentality, I still think that humanity will start to be more and more scientific. This could seriously lead to a, you know, a type one civilization, you know, on the Kardashev scale where we're like really harnessing the power of the sun. And then yeah. maybe we start to harness the power of the solar system and then eventually harness the power of our galaxy like this could be truly the start of a insanely intelligent species that we can't even conceive of yet awesome yeah yeah well i think that's a good place to end it so thank you everyone for listening this has been the future of mars and we'll see you next time the past, the present, and the future. Our computer is picking up a strange signal. The past, the present, and the future, baby. What's the world coming to? The past, the present, and the future. The past, the present, and the future, baby. The past, the present. Hey futurists, if you've made it this far, you might be wondering who created the Hence the Future theme song. It was created by the Walden Brothers, and you can find them on Spotify. The Walden Brothers also produced the sound bites for the worst case, the best case, and the most likely future scenarios. At Hence the Future, we're always looking for ways to improve the quality of our episodes and our predictions. To that end, we're building a team of researchers to curate the most authoritative and highly vetted sources as the foundation for every episode. If you'd like to support these efforts, you can donate a small monthly amount at anchor.fm slash hence the future. And if you haven't done so already, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate your support.